Alright, well, good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of the day you're watching this. Uh, we're going to continue with our largest unit in Business Law 2, uh, the discussion of the different forms uh, that business can exist in under the law. And we're moving now into really the heart of these chapters, which is corporate formation. Um, you know, again, uh, kind of an amateur frustrated historian here you have to understand that though we live with it every day that that we just um, take for granted the existence of corporations you do need to understand that they were really a creation of the modern world that in many ways um, corporations are a product of industrialization um, a product of modern society uh, they were very rare uh, prior to the 1800s um, and they were looked at with great suspicion you know <clears throat> there are lots of things that were looked at with a lot of suspicion um, by in the age of enlightenment beyond standing armies because they were associated with the king uh, corporations they were associated with uh, banking and corruption in the government because some things never change um, <clears throat> so it's only we're really with the end of the 19th beginning of the 20th century the corporations kind of come into their own and we begin to see more and more of them and they they take a lot of forms and there's a lot of uh, impact on uh, both economics and on business law which is uh, this class okay so let's look at uh, the nature of corporations uh, like I said prior to uh, about 1800 corporations are pretty rare in the beginning um, the debate was kind of the similar debate that we saw with um, uh, is a partnership an entity or an aggregate um, now very early on the Supreme Court 1819 in the case of trustees of Dartmouth College versus Woodward the Supreme Court begins to take the position Supreme Court of the United States begin to take the position that corporations are separate entities are people as been said now this is most critically confirmed um, really in, in head notes by a court reporter surprisingly enough in S Santa Clara County versus uh, Southern Pacific Railroad very important case comes down in 1888 so you can see that at the beginning of the 19th century 1819 we're beginning to feel our way out as what corporations are going to be like by the ending of the 19th century they're definitely going to be treated as separate entities or to use Ms. Mitt Romney's rather inelegant phrase, corporations are people. Um, now, they're not completely people. Um, yes, they're persons. They can sue, be sued. They have rights. But they only have civil rights. They don't have criminal rights. Because if you think about it, you have criminal rights because you have criminal responsibilities. You can be incarcerated. You can be executed. And you can't do that to a corporation corporation does something wrong you can take money from it but they lack full criminal rights uh, as an entity uh, the next thing about it is the personnel now there's three groups that we're going to talk about and you know these groups kind of blend into each other uh, it's not always a stark contrast so like in a very small corporation it's very very likely that the management the officers and the shareholders are all the same people um, and then you have a very large corporations you can have people that have a, a title of officer or management director whatever you want to call it but they may be doing something significantly different and a shareholder may behave much different in fact I would argue does behave much much different in a large corporation you know if I own shares of stock in uh, Microsoft or in Google uh, I'm buying it because I want it to make money. I'm not buying it because I want to run Microsoft or Google. In a very small corporation, if I bought stock in, say, Goodberries in Raleigh or a, a, you know, a small startup here, you'd be doing it maybe for the return on investment, but also for the degree of control you'd have over it. So shareholders in, in the perfect world, I guess we could say, are the owners. Their liability is limited, both civil and criminal, they don't really have much criminal liability to just their capital investment how much they paid for their stock or their security the officers run the corporation day to day 
and and you can have any title you want as an officer you could call someone king or rex or uh you know uh, centurion i don't care um it's up to the corporation to decide what the duties of these officers are but they they really are carrying out policy they shouldn't be making policy the people who make policy are management and management typically another term that's often used is the directors because when you think about a corporation you have a board of directors so um, they set policy um, and they may or may not depending upon the size of the corporation again uh, be more or less involved in running the corporation as well. Again, they have limited liability. Most of their liability is to the shareholders that they're doing a good job. Now, when we talk about all these and we talk about corporation and things like this, just be aware that there is a world of difference between a very small corporation that you know is just maybe a sole proprietorship deciding to incorporate and become a subchapter S corp to a medium-sized corporation uh, that may be like you know like a, a local HVAC that has five or ten or twenty employees to a, a larger corporation that might have hundreds of employees something like you know Red Hat um, to a, a mega corporation like Amazon or Microsoft or Exxon um, they're all often share the same terms but those terms often mean different things to them alright well a, a big concern here is, of course, corporate taxation. How are corporations taxed? Well, again, you have to distinguish between the theory and the reality. Now, corporations are, theoretically, taxed as separate entities. So what they do is they pay out their expenses for operating the corporation, um, salaries, capital expenses, you know, labor materials everything and then the profits that are left over are subject to taxation now I say that's in theory um, depending upon again the size of the corporation and your necessity to maintain your tax status you ha you might have a very vested interest running a relatively small corporation to show that it earns virtually nothing um, because you you usually with a smaller corporation can spend money to benefit people that work for the corporation often own the corporation with pre-tax dollars so after the taxes are paid if there are any we then the corporation then pays out money to the shareholders in dividends. They all, of course, you know, you have to pay the bondholders back, you have to pay your employees, you have to pay for the, the stuff you bought. But at the end of the day, if you do have some money, it's called retained earnings, uh, or earnings, uh, you can pay it out as dividends. Now you can keep some of this if you say, well, you know, yeah, we made a million dollars this year, but I want to spend more money next year buying a new factory, buying more cars or vans or um, you know, setting up training or something. So you can retain earnings. Now what often goes on once a corporation gets large enough is that they begin to create separate entities to move those, to move the profit to those entities. So you set up a holding company and this holding or parent company owns say the U.S. branch of it and then that holding company has lots of income but it has to pay for stuff to the this holding company gets paid for its subsidiary so let me give you a, a practical example of this um, I'm gonna uh, sh let's suppose that Nike uh, wants to operate in the United States now Nike um, Nike uh, shoes are 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 very Nike shoes are um, you know very expensive why are they expensive because of the Nike logo the basic is what it comes down to it so what Nike has done is you have Nike USA and you have Nike Bermuda and I'm just playing around with this Nike Bermuda which is in a very low tax area okay virtually no tax owns the Nike swoosh they will license that to Nike USA so when Nike USA makes a sneaker 
and let's just say it costs $100 when it retail. And it gets that $100. Well, the factory that was set up and the labor that was paid for it was maybe $30 or $40. But now they have to pay another corporate entity for the Nike swoosh because they don't own it. So they pay $70 to put that swoosh on there. Now, you, some of you might be saying, well, why are they paying money to themselves? Because that's essentially what they're doing. Because a U.S. corporation subject to high tax, owned by a parent corporation standing outside the United States, which also owns another corporation in Bermuda, okay? The U.S. corporation pays the Bermuda corporation. The Bermuda corporation shows the profit. The U.S. corporation shows the loss. No tax. That's how it works. So, you know, people often talk about, well, you know, taxes are too high. So let's look at this next slide here. Uh, this is uh, effective top income tax. And you'll notice that somewhat ironically during the, the greatest period of American expansion and growth, the highest growth rates the United States ever saw, corporate taxes in fact were fairly high, uh, well over 40% through the 1980s. That's really the, the you know, the, the years of fat and growth in the American economy. You'll notice though that over time um, the U.S. top rate of corporations fell and under the last administration it fell from a high of about 38 percent down to about 20 percent. So really from 40 to 20. We cut the corporate tax in half. But it was already below 20. If, if you'll notice that even when it was cut from 40 percent, the effective tax rate, the actual rate the corporations were paying in the United States, was not the paper rate of 40. It was an effective rate of about 15. And by cutting it down to 20, that drove it down even further. So that really effective corporate taxes now for a C Corp, we're not talking about for an S Corp, are now below 10 percent. Um, now, of course, you, you know, you need money to fund the government. So as you stop getting a lot of money from corporations, you're going to have to get money from somebody to run this thing. And of course, you're going to get it from taxpayers. So it's very common to use these offshore tricks and uh, tax expenditures to avoid taxes. This next slide should give you an idea. Um, this is Walmart. Walmart has 78 subsidiaries outside the United States in these tax havens. Now most of these places, the Cayman Islands, Barbados, British Virgin Island, Ireland was really bad for a while, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, Cyprus, Switzerland, uh, Mauritius Island, Singapore, Gibraltar, Curacao. Walmart has no stores in any of those. Walmart is a retailer. It, it has stores, it sells money. So those stores are these entities I talked about where when Walmart makes a profit, they pay, in theory, these subsidiaries. The money goes overseas out of the U.S. and sits there. All right. So the Walmart heirs make lots of money um, and it's just not taxed. Okay, uh, rights and torts. Let's move on from the taxation issue. Um, you get most civil rights. Now obviously the managers, the officers, the shareholders all retain their individual constitutional rights. You don't waive any constitutional rights by owning a share of stock or working for a company or directing a company. Corporations are also liable for torts committed by their officers or agents who are acting within the scope of their authority. And this goes back to employment law, which we talked about really in Business Law 1, the doctrine of respondeat superior, or if we use the older Latin translation, let the master reply, or let the employer be responsible. Criminally, it's very rare that corporations are punished, because after all, how do you punish them? Now, obviously, if an officer, a manager, or a shareholder commits a criminal act, they individually can be prosecuted. But if someone directed or supported by the corporation does it, so if a corporate person says, goes to a work on a factory line and says, yeah, uh, go ahead and um, dispose of these chemicals by just dumping them down the drain, even though it's illegal. And the employee does that. Well, the employee has liability. Just because someone orders you to do something illegal doesn't excuse your liability. 
Okay, so they've got civil liability, they have criminal liability. Because this is something in furtherance of a corporate goal, the corporation is criminally liable as well. But what are you going to do to it? The, the most you can do pretty much is fine it. Now for smaller corporations, you do have what's called the corporate death penalty, where you simply dissolve them. This is very rare. You really almost never see it, um, but it's a possibility. All right, let's move on to where corporations are. So let's talk about where and who and why. So we're going to use North Carolina as our example. A domestic corporation in North Carolina is one that was formed in North Carolina. So I think Red Hat locally, Goodberries, another local corporation. These are corporations that were formed in North Carolina. I think Food Lion actually was formed here, if I'm not mistaken, as well. But it, it is called then a domestic corporation. It is a North Carolina corporation. If you were in Virginia, you'd have to have a Virginia corporation to be domestic. A foreign corporation, and most people when I say foreign think, oh, you're talking about someone who's not an American. No. A foreign corporation in North Carolina means a corporation from another state, like Delaware. So IBM, I believe, is incorporated in Delaware. Therefore, in North Carolina, IBM is a foreign corporation. Well, what about a corporation like Volkswagen or Nissan or uh, Kia? Well, they're not called foreign, they're called alien corporations, which means they're incorporated outside the United States. So domestic incorporated in a state, foreign incorporated outside of the state, but still in the US, alien incorporated out of the United States. Now we also have public corporations and private corporations, though 99.9% .9 of corporations are private. They're formed by private citizens. So Walmart, uh, GM, Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, all those are private corporations. Doesn't mean that no one can invest in them, it just means they're private citizens. There are also public corporations. These are corporations formed by the government. Tennessee Valley Authority, the, the corporation for public broadcasting, you know, PBS, Public Broadcasting Service. Those are formed by the government for usually a, a governmental purpose. We also have, and there really should be three categories here, because the first one can be subdivided. You have corporations that are non-profit, and sometimes you'll hear not-for-profit, and there's some subtle distinctions there that we're not going to go into. Then there are for-profit corporations. So the two that we're concerned about, the two we'll talk about because we're not going to make a big distinction, is non-profit, which don't make money in theory, although they can be huge. Uh, Mike, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is a huge corporation and is in theory a non-profit. And then profit corporations. Ownership. Uh, now we we break down ownership as either closed ownership or opened ownership. Now closed ownership would usually be smaller corporations. And uh, open ownership might be a sole proprietorship that has decided to incorporate and maybe has four or five people that own shares of stock. Management in closed corporations tends to be treated much more like a partnership. And one of the big problems with these small corporations is um, since they often don't pay dividends, they often make money and retain earnings and they, they pay salaries to the shareholders who are usually sitting on the, uh, actually working for it. There's not a lot of value to the shares per se and it can be tough to transfer them. What are they worth? Um, you often have shareholder agreements, you often have key, key employee agreements, but closed corporations, you know, you need to be aware that if you're buying into a small corporation and you say, well, how many, what's its assets? Oh, it has $10 million in assets. And how many shares of stock does it have? It has uh, 10,000 shares. Well, 10,000 divided into 10 million, each share of stock should be worth $1,000. Well, no. If you've got one person that owns 6,000 of those 10,000 shares, the other 4,000 shares aren't worth very much because it might never declare a dividend in which case you're just owning something for the sake of owning it. Open corporations are different. These, the actual ownership is held by others. Um, so you, larger companies, larger corporations. Now, the interesting thing is the bigger a corporation becomes, and this is where I, 
I, I kind of go back to different roles for different people. The larger a corporation becomes, the more often that the shareholders stop acting like owners and the management starts acting like owners. They act like they own it for their benefit, even if the shareholders in theory own it. All right, let's talk about, and I've made some references to Chapter S. Let's talk about a Chapter S Corp. Now, there, first of all, there's some qualifications for Chapter S, and it's called electing an S because it, it falls under the um, IRS code. First of all, you have to be a domestic corporation, and remember, domestic means you're, you're formed in, you're doing business in one state. Limited ownership, so generally no other corporation should own a sub S. Should have fewer than 75 owners, so it's very often a closed corp. One class of stock, because remember you can have multiple classes of stock, and no alien or non-resident owners. You then can elect under the IRS and under the, the North Carolina Department of Revenue's code to be treated as a subchapter S corp. We call you an S corp. What's the big benefits? Well, you can offset income more easily, but the big one, the huge one, is there's no corporate taxes. Once you declare you're an S, you are a tax reporting entity, not a tax paying entity, and you still have some of the benefits, by the way, of spending money on things with these pre-tax dollars, but you can pass that money directly to shareholders. So it's a huge benefit. It's, a, it, it, it's huge, and there are many, many, many sub-S corps. Professionals can also incorporate. They use different ones, so you'll sometimes see SC, which is a service corporation, uh, PC, professional corporation, PA, professional association. You're going to have liability, though. Uh, you're treated more like a partnership if you're a professional and you're incorporating. Um, professionals retain their individual liability. You know, professionals, it depends on your state that you're in, will adopt either an LLC, an LLP, an SC, a PC, a PA. Depends what they do. It also depends upon what their profession allows them to do. So, you know, one of the things you can't do in under as a lawyer is ever set up a shell where you have no liability for malpractice yourself. All right, formation. How do we set these things up? Um, the first person who decides, well, I'm going to start a corporation is called the promoter. And they often circulate a prospectus. Here's what we're going to do if anybody wants to invest money. And that promoter has personal liability for everything he does until incorporation. Once it's incorporated, okay, the corporation may assume all these liabilities, and usually does because that's why the promoter is doing it. The people you get to invest are called subscribers, and they pay a subscription. That's the amount of the money. So they're going to get stocks, bonds, or a mix of the two. The next thing you do in incorporation is you go to your state charter. Now, you can do this online. Historically, Delaware was the place to do it because it was really easy, almost no corporate taxes, very friendly corporate laws. But it's up to you to select what where you want to do it. Now North Carolina has a pretty easy process. Used to be a little bit more formal. It used to be kind of cool in some ways because they give you a nice stamped corporate charter with a nice seal and those days have kind of ended. Um, what you do is you get a draft of your articles of incorporation and you file this draft with the North Carolina Secretary of State. Other states might use different people to take it but that's what we do in North Carolina. Um, and it sets out, this is how the corporation is structured, and this is what it's going to do. So here's what's in your articles of incorporation at a bare minimum. Your corporate name. Now this is actually something you do before. Um, you have a corporate name search run. And you go to the North Carolina Secretary of State and say, I want to call my corporation Orion Corporation. They'll type in Orion Corporation. Yep, yep, no one's used it. You can use that. If you say, I want to call my corporation McDonald's, they'd say, no, can't use that, it's already used. So you have to have a unique name, one that's not easily confused with another corporation. Um, and then we'll allow you to incorporate. Now, your, your book talks about ultra vires a bit, and it's, it's really kind of silly. 
but basically in your articles incorporation everyone I've ever drafted and set up I said for any and all legal activity and that really avoids the whole ultra-virus problem which says well you incorporated to run a railroad and now you're trying to run um, you know an airplane or airline that's silly duration most of the time almost always it's perpetual capital structure how you're setting this thing up financially um, internal organization now you can do this in the bylaws instead uh, but here's the important one the registered agent this is the person that you nominate that when your corporation gets sued he or she is going to get the paper so they're going to get the summons they're going to get the the lawsuit they're going to get the complaint um, and you got to keep this current if you don't and that person gets served and it comes back to the person suing the corporation then I can simply file with the North Carolina Secretary of State that I'm suing a corporation and the registered agent has responded and that's deemed to be proper I also note the incorporators all right there is a quickie sample of one of the first pages of a uh, articles of incorporation and this is for North Carolina you'll see it says the name the number and the shares of incorporated that are issued to are, are there multiple classes and if there are you got to describe them um, your address okay of your registered office your agent your mailing address your principal office uh, number of streets um, and again it would go on it, it would be a little bit more than this now after you file if you've done everything right you're going to get a um, big piece of paper used to, like I said it used to be a really nice piece of paper from the um, Secretary of State's office that you are incorporated this is your certificate of incorporation after that you're gonna have your first meeting your your organizational meeting your corporation you're gonna adopt your bylaws if the if the articles of incorporation are your constitution like the US Constitution then your bylaws are your day-to-day -day laws you're gonna ratify any debts if there were debts the incorporator set up you're gonna elect the board you're gonna select your officers you're gonna issue stock now if there's a problem if you screw up your incorporation this can limit your ability uh, it can limit the ability of third parties to sue or be sued too by the corporation or sue the corporation so you do want to follow pro proper procedure um, now de facto de jour uh, again this is kind of like the ultra viris which is beyond the scope when you're operating a corporation that in theory was set up to do one thing but it's doing lots of others because it's really so easy to set it up that you don't really see people failing that often but we'll cover each of these terms de jure de facto de jure is existing in law you've had substantial compliance um, only the state not a third party can attack the corporation as being in existence okay once a certificate of incorporation has been issued on du jour under law you can't attack that corporation as being incorporated you can still sue it de facto means you had been able to legally incorporate you made a good faith effort you started business but you haven't quite gotten there yet you also can have corporation by estoppel again it's it's so easy now to incorporate that virtually no one can screw this up although all right so express powers like I said you you get together after you incorporate and you're setting up the organization here are our bylaws this is the day-to-day -day organization often in your bylaws they're gonna say um, this is gonna be the president's job this is gonna be the board directors job. you're gonna set up what everybody does now what if there's conflicts well of course you know if you set up something that said the the purpose of this uh, corporation is to um, deprive people of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness you know it's not like US Constitution but you could say to, to kill people randomly well that's a violation of the US Constitution it's no good is it a violation of the state constitution is it a violation of state law or federal law that, that should really be in there is it a violation of the articles is it a violation of the bylaws is it a violation of the uh, board of directors now one of the things let me go back there one of the things uh, to be aware of is that um, 
you know, you, you sometimes people are a little careless. Uh, sometimes people do make mistakes. Uh, that's certainly okay. Um, but most of the time you want what that corporation can and can't do to be uh, expressly stated. Uh, you don't want a problem. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you get problems. Uh, I'm just going to put in federal statute here uh, because federal law would come before the state constitutional law because of the supremacy of the um, U.S. Constitution. Okay, let's talk about the implied powers. Um, these arise naturally once a corporation is formed. They can perform any reasonable business act, buy and sell property, uh, pay people salaries. If there's an extraordinary act, like going out of business or selling all corporate assets, usually you've got to have the approval of the board of directors for that. Okay, this goes back to ultra vires. This uh, very old term, it's a Latin term, it means beyond the pale, beyond the scope, beyond the powers. Corporations are not allowed to act beyond their powers. So let's suppose you set up a corporation for a very limited purpose. I'm going to set up this corporation just to develop um, the property in uh, Mitchell County, North Carolina. That's all it says it can do. And then it decides, well, I'm not going to develop property in Mitchell County, North Carolina. I'm going to build a hotel in Manteo, the other end of the state. You would be operating ultra vires. You're not allowed. If you act outside of the power of the corporation, your actions can't be binding on other parties. Because of that, almost everybody that incorporates nowadays says, this is the purpose of the corporation, but um, it can do any and all things that are legal in the state of North Carolina. So you, you just don't see it. Okay, here's a big concern, piercing the corporate veil. What does this mean? This means you're trying to hold the owners personally liable. Someone sets up a corporation and they treat it like their own little piggy bank or they commit fraud with it. So when, and if I can show that you set up a corporation and you're using it to commit fraud or you didn't follow, you didn't really set up a corporation, then I can pierce that corporation and hold you, the individual stockholder or the person that set it up, as personally liable. So you can do it if there's trick or fraud to induce you to deal with a corporation. If the corporation really wasn't set up to make money, this is usually the problem of undercapitalization, and the IRS will get after you for this too. If a corporation doesn't show profit over usually a three or five year period, or if there's not enough money ever put into the corporation for it to make money, undercapitalized, sometimes will pierce the corporate veil. If you don't, and this is a problem I've had with clients, if you don't have corporate meetings, if you don't take corporate votes, if, if you commingle personal assets, and this is hard to impress on people. If you have someone who, sole shareholder, Mike's Plumbing, he sets up Mike's Plumbing Incorporated. He gets a check. Well, he may be very casual. He might say, I'm going to put this in my personal checking account because after all, it's a sub S. I'm just going to deposit it in the corporate account and then have the corporate account write me a check. That's bull. I'm just going to deposit right away. The problem with that is you've started to commingle things. And the result is you're individually liable now. So this is a major problem for small or closely held corporations. All right, let's talk about the different types of corporate financing. Where does corporations get their money to start? Okay, so there's different ways you can raise money. But there's two basic broad terms. We talk about equity or debt. Now equity is a share of stock, 99 times out of 100. Debt is a bond, 99 times out of so, so I, I say that, what is a bond? Let's, a, a bond is evidence of debt, but it gives you no ownership. So large corporations, Microsoft, IBM, Walmart, issue corporate bonds. And what they do is they say, we promise we will repay the money we're borrowing from you at a later date. We're going to pay this income, a percentage. Um, so you repay it at face value plus whatever interest. There's going to be a maturity date when you get your principal back. Sometimes there's fixed income, which is the amount of money you get per period. Now, if you've got a large, stable corporation, these bonds are almost as good as federal treasury. So you get a bond from Google, that's a pretty good bond. 
you get a bond from a corporation that's in trouble, like you know, famously right now, GameStop. Although I'm dating myself, um, a corporate bond from GameStop. You don't know if GameStop's going to be here in a year or two, so it might have a very low value. Uh, you might have to discount it heavily. So it might say it's a hundred dollar bond, but you might be able to buy it for fifty, betting it's still going to be here. That's a corporate bond, and that's uh, for one of the most famous corporations that ever existed, and that's uh, Standard Oil, which later became essentially Exxon and a whole bunch of other companies. Well, at one time, was the largest corporation in the world. Stocks are a little different. Now, stocks, you you give money to the corporation or someone that holds a share of stock in the corporation, and what do you get? You get ownership. You get a percentage ownership of the company you get control, you get a percentage right to vote, and you get ownership of earnings, you get dividends when they come back. So you get those three things if you own stock. Now you notice that a bond only gives you money coming in, doesn't give you ownership, doesn't give you control. It does have one advantage over a piece of, of stock. Bonds get paid first. So if a company doesn't have enough money to pay a dividend, it will pay its bonds first. You get voting rights with each share. Although, and this is where classes of share become important, not all shares are equal. You also can have something called preferred stock, and this is something you got to be careful about if you're investing and buying stock. Is you're you're getting ready to buy a, a small corporation stock, and they're gonna they've got common stock and they got preferred stock, and the preferred stock is a little bit more expensive. You say, well, I don't want to buy something more expensive. It's one share of stock, one share. Of, I'll just buy the common stock. The next year the corporation makes money, you go, oh great, I'm going to get some money, I'm going to get a dividend. And what it turns out is that cumulative preferred stock has never been paid, never got a dividend. But every year it didn't get a dividend, it built up a right to collect a dividend. So it, it starts to kind of look like a bond, um, and it means that it gets paid first. So it might be good to have a preferred stock. You also have convertible stock that can change from preferred to common and back and forth. Uh, there's a picture of the National Tea Company's stock. Again, at, at one point these things used to be really ornate and beautifully printed. I mean, if you see the old IBM shares of stock, they've got winged mercury on them, and uh, AT&T has all these flowers. and, and really really pretty and there are people that actually collect these things nowadays um, most stock is held virtually so you don't see these certificates okay other types of stock you can construct as many different types of stock as you want now to give you a quick example and I talked a little bit about this um, let's suppose I want to control a corporation but I don't want to own most of the shares of stock so I'm going to set up five shares of stock uh, five classes. Class A, B, C, D, E. A, B, C, D, E. Five shares. Five classes. There's 100 shares of A, 100 shares of B, 100 shares of C, 100 shares of D, and there is uh, 9,600 shares of E class stock. And I offer it for sale. And let's suppose that I own no class E stocks but I own all the A, B, C, D. And I set up the bylaws that say the board of directors shall be elected uh, each, ele there shall be five people on the board, of elect the board of directors to control the corporation. Each director shall be elected by a separate category of stock, A, B, C, D. And what that means is you could own 9,600 shares. I could own 400 shares out of the 10,000. So I could own four percent but I would absolutely control that board and hence the corporation so again be careful find out if there's different classes and and the IRS is different organizations have cracked down on this a little bit and placed limits on it all right um, venture and private equity capital just a few quick points because I want to keep this under 40 minutes or so if you have a very high risk investment, so you know, we're scrambling right now. The big thing that's really preventing, I would say, um, the, the sort of move towards renewables is 
is storage of energy. A lot of these renewables can generate energy at particular times of day, but they can't do it constantly. And that's where fossil fuels have a big advantage. So let's suppose I come up and I say, I've got a battery that I think is great and will solve this issue. But I need $100 million to build a factory. And it may not work. If it does, we're all going to be rich beyond belief. Well, it's a high risk investment. So I'm going to expect a very high rate of return. I'm going to say, okay, um, I will invest $100 million. You can build your factory. But I want 40% of all the money you make. So invest investors in venture capital typically get very high rates of ownership or very high rates of return. And you could split this up however you wanted. You could split it up as um, I'll take uh, so much stock and so much bond on it. A private equity capital is very specific firms funded by wealthy investors, usually private equity. They buy whole corps. They go in and just buy everything. All right, well, that gives us an idea then, uh, and we've really just touched the surface about corporate formation, corporate governance, a few things like that, but we'll move on uh, whenever you're ready to the next chapter.